I am requiring you to do something for me. I look around wildly, trying to locate whoever just spoke. It's the middle of the night, and I'd been under the impression that I was alone in the gym, and a quick scan confirms that I am. It takes another moment for me to realize who it was. I ground and find an orange glow of power seeping out from under the shield that I keep over the onyx bond with Tarn. I lift the shield. Is that your version of asking for help? I inquire. No, I am neither asking nor do I need assistance. I am requiring that you complete a task that you should have already done of your own volition. Taren responds testily. Okay? You are to restore Sagil's contentedness. I only manage to hold it in for a second before a snort escapes. I might just as easily require that you regard me with any modicum of respect. It would be a completely futile exercise. She's barely even spoken to me over the last two weeks, and certainly not about that. Which is why you need to fix this, Taren growls. Sounds to me like you do need assistance. I feel his anger radiating through the bond like an onyx storm. I had effectively ameliorated my own part in this before you made it even worse. Before she wasn't so far gone that she didn't still burn for me. That was enough to get her talking about it that night, and though she still refused to couple with me, we had a productive fight and I'm sure she would have forgiven me within a few days. But then you butted in, and since then even our physical need for each other hasn't been enough to get her to fight with me about it again. It is not like her. If this were anyone else, I'd give them shit about wanting to get laid, but I'd prefer not to have my head torn off by the world's largest morning star. Plus, I get the impression that, even though I'm sure it would be a nice perk for him, his real reason for coming to me is much more profound. I honestly wish I could. I want to fix this too, but I don't know how, I tell him. Figure it out. This situation didn't become so serious that I couldn't have salvaged it on my own until you got involved. I sigh. Okay. I'll do my best to come up with something. That is insufficient, Taren accuses. You will fix this, or as the source of the problem, I would be all too happy to eliminate you. I grin and shake my head. Yeah, yeah, you can cool it with your empty threats. I just meant let me think about it for a while. Taren's only response is an irritated grumble, and then he's gone. I spend the next hour analyzing the situation for what must be the dozenth time before a new idea finally occurs to me. Are you still awake, Taren? Yes, I am unable to sleep. I wonder what that's like, I say, sarcasm dripping from my tone. I think I came up with something that might work, but I'd need a couple things from you. You're not going to like it, but I assume you'd be willing to make peace with it if it restores Sagale's contentedness. Taren gives another grumble of annoyance. Is that a yes? It depends on what these things are, he growls. Okay. First of all, I need you to agree to have another uncomfortable conversation with me sometime in the near future, because I need your help with something unrelated to this. How dare you demand a favor from a dragon, Tarn seethes. There will be no quid pro quo. You will do this because I will end your family line if you refuse. I'm not refusing and I'm not demanding a favor in return, I say patiently, having figured that this would be his response. I'm telling you that if you agree to hear me out about this other thing, I think I can fix things with Sagale, but if you don't, then I'm quite certain that I can't. I will require that you explain how that is the case, but if I am satisfied that what you say is true, then I will hear your request, if it is made with sufficient humility. I guess that's good enough to be getting on with, so we'll come back to that, but the other thing I need is basically for you to tell me a secret. My patience with you wears thin, wing leader. What is the secret you wish to know? I couldn't care less. It doesn't matter what it is or how insignificant. As long as it's something that Sagale will know, I couldn't have learned about from anywhere but you. I think I see where you're going with this, and I don't like it. I told you you wouldn't, but I don't see any other way of fixing this, so unless you do, your choice is either dealing with the fact that you don't like it, or continuing to deal with a pissed-off Sagale. Give me a minute to think of a secret that would work. Today has been significantly better than the last couple of weeks, which were miserable. I've felt like shit for upsetting Sagale, and her anger and despondency leaking through our bond hasn't helped my mood either. Taren and I wrapped up our planning session in the wee hours of the morning. At first, he acted annoyed about having to agree to certain parts of my plan, but after fleshing it out with him for another half hour, by the end, I could tell that he was surreptitiously excited at the prospect that it really might work. Though, of course, he'd never admit to that. 
He left off by telling me that some gesture he had planned would require him to fly to a lake that's an hour or so away after flight lessons with Violet. He didn't know how long it would take once he got there, so the tentative schedule for executing our scheme was late this evening, with sometime tomorrow being the backup plan if it took him longer than he hoped. That left me in a state of nervous but eager anticipation all day, which made for a nice change. I'm still waiting for his go-ahead when there's a knock on my door, and using the shadows outside the door, I can feel from his massive build that it's Garrick. I flick my hand to unlock the door, and he comes in. Hey, I hadn't wanted to bring it up again. You've been so moody since that night with the churum, but you seemed a lot more upbeat today, Garrick observes after closing and locking the door behind him again. Did whatever Mason wanted to talk to you about turn out to be anything? And if so, I get it if you can't tell me what it is, but I wanted to at least see if there's anything I can do to help. Oh, no, it was nothing, I say, waving a hand casually. Just Mason overthinking things as usual. Well, that's good, he says, and then he pauses for a few seconds before asking, and would it be a bad idea for me to ask whether you and Sigale have patched things up, and what was going on there? I sigh. She's pissed that I thanked Taren, since she apparently feels like what he did is even more intimate than I thought, to the extent that she considers it borderline cheating on her. But yeah, today I've been feeling hopeful, since I think I'll be able to make it better either later tonight or tomorrow. Ah, Garrick says thoughtfully. I suppose even if we didn't know the extent of it, I should have known that it'd be a bad idea to thank him for being intimate with other dragons. You weren't kidding about that being bad advice. Sorry. I should have known better too, but neither of us were thinking particularly straight that night, and hopefully it'll be water under the bridge soon, so don't worry about it, I tell him. Does that not thinking straight comment imply that you now consider our other plan from that night to be a bad idea too? Or is your mood improved enough to consider it? Apparently, Atos has designated Tuesday nights as hand-to-hand -hand practice time for his squad, so Violet and Imogen are in the gym right now. I grin and shake my head. Come on, man. We were high. That plan was ridiculous. I'm not denying that, Garrick smirks. But I think the logic behind it was pretty good, and I haven't been able to come up with a better plan to accomplish those same ends. Nobody has to know it was planned. It'd just look like a particularly intense sparring session. You seriously want to go fight shirtless to see if it catches the eye of our crushes? I ask incredulously. That is some teenager-level immaturity. We're only 22. Cut us some slack, Garrick exclaims. Less than half a year ago, your scribe crush was still a teenager. I look at him dubiously, but I don't say anything as I give it some actual consideration now that I realize he's not joking. We seriously need to stop constantly dwelling on this shit, one way or the other, Garrick presses. And how else are we going to get past it? I sigh and shake my head, still unconvinced. I can just keep pestering you until you want to beat the shit out of me again, he teases annoyingly. Are you sure you're not still a teenager? I chide. Are you sure you're not just worried I'm going to kick your ass and embarrass you in front of violence? Oh, you're asking for it. Now I'm not going to take it easy on you for once, I say, getting to my feet. Yes! Garrick exclaims. Let me just grab my fighting leathers. What? No, shirtless, remember? There's already a bunch of people there at this time of day, plus their entire squad? No way, I say definitively, opening my armoire. If you don't go all out on this with me, I'm going to tell Imogen and Bodhi about your little nickname for Soren Gale, Garrick threatens. I pause. As bad as it is that he'll never let me live it down, I'm well aware from growing up with those little pains in my ass that Imogen and Bodhi knowing an embarrassing secret about you is ten times worse. Garrick grins at me mischievously because he knows it too. For Dune's sake, I curse. Forget teenager, you're a fucking child. Garrick laughs maniacally as I toss my leathers back into the armoire. We're just leaving my room when Taren speaks into my mind. I have returned. Are you ready? No, too much nervous energy, I reply, which isn't untrue. I'm headed to the gym for a workout. I'll be in a better headspace afterwards and less likely to fuck it up, so let's do it then. Your actions have already resulted in my having to wait almost a month. Taren accuses, and I realize that he's hoping my apology, together with whatever his gesture is, will be enough for him to get lucky tonight. Hey, are you... Garrick starts as we reach the stairwell, but then he notices the glazed expression on my face. Oh, you're talking. I'll wait. I'll do whatever you require of me, but I'm always sharper after a good workout, I advise Taren. I can try now, but I'd be more concerned about it going poorly and potentially resulting in another month-long drought for you. Taren growls his displeasure. 
Apparently Violet is in the gym too, I continue, and from what Liam tells me it would seem your relationship with Sigail isn't the only one that's suffering due to your bad mood. Maybe you could spend some time coaching her to do whatever it is you're going to require of her to start channeling. Do not make the mistake of thinking that our cooperation today gives you license to speak to me as if I have ever made a mistake, wing leader. It is not a matter of coaching her combat skills. My power is so vast that using it is a grave responsibility. She begged me not to execute the traitorous wing leader, which is proof that she is still behaving too erratically to be trusted with it. Are you kidding? I demand, harnessing my indignation to make a show of being bold when interacting with Taren like Sigail had suggested before she effectively stopped talking to me. Of course she's been behaving erratically. She's a human. For one moment, try to imagine what it must be like to go through life without the arguably misplaced certainty that you can do no wrong. She has been through so much shit over the last half a year. It's absolutely mind-blowing that she's handling it as well as she is. She kept her shit together even after bonding with you and learning it meant being tied for the rest of her life to the one person alive that she hates most. If I can find a decent excuse, I'd even be happy to pick a fight with her to demonstrate, for the hundredth time, how the most physically vulnerable candidate in the Quadrant is so emotionally and cognitively formidable that she can stand her ground against arguably the most physically powerful when you take into account my signet. Are you still... Garrick asks with a note of apprehension in his voice. I glance at him and my anger must be written on my face because it shuts him up. Yeah, you are. Okay. I will wait. Taren says, continuing on the previous topic rather than acknowledging anything I just said, but only because I don't trust you to successfully execute the plan while distracted, just like you failed during that trial. That is a liability you will have to overcome as the human leader of the revolution. You need to be able to function at the best of your ability at any time, regardless of your momentary state of mind. Do better. With that, he shuts me out. Garrick and I step out into the courtyard, and I let out an audible grumble of frustration. I can tell that this is going to be a bad time to bring this up, Garrick says, but now that we're actually on our way to do this, I'm starting to see where you were coming from about this maybe not being the best idea to do for real. Are you fucking kidding me? I demand. Absolutely not. You're the one who dragged me down here to do this, and I need to beat the shit out of something right now, so we're doing this. All right, I'm happy to spar with you if you need to let some steam off, Garrick relents. But the whole thing with the girls? I don't know, maybe you were right before. We were high, it's a stupid- Garrick, listen to yourself. I step in front of him. You are a fucking badass dragon rider. You have been in mortal danger more times than I can count and never batted an eye. Why is it that Imogen is the one subject that gives you cold feet? And there's nothing to be concerned about anyway because she likes you back. It's almost like you're more afraid of that than the prospect of being rejected. Garrick glowers at me for several seconds. I would think that you might be able to sympathize with that idea considering I could say the exact same thing to you regarding Sorengale. I startle slightly, as if he'd unexpectedly swung for my face. But fine, as overly dramatic as it feels now that we're sober and on our way to actually do it, it seems like the logic behind the plan is still sound, Garrick says, shoving his way past me. And I want to kick your ass now too, so let's go. You're gonna kick my ass? Yeah, right, I say, jogging to catch up with him. As if I'd go easy on you so you can impress Imogen. I'm gonna wipe the floor with you and she's still gonna swoon over you anyway. I'm gonna wipe the ceiling with you, and Sorengale's gonna manifest a gravity-wielding signet to be able to fall up there and rip the rest of your clothes off. A minute later, we walk into the gym, and our bond instantly directs my attention to the mat where Violet appears to be taking a momentary pause in her sparring session. As I get closer, I hear Rhiannon tell her, We've been at this for an hour. You're tired, and the last thing I want is to hurt you. Challenges resume after solstice. You're not doing me any favors by holding back. Violence responds, I read her with my second signet, and I see that it's not really Rhiannon that she's upset with, so much as she's generally irritable because of something Taryn was just saying. Apparently he's taking his frustration with me out on her. I think back to what I was just admonishing Taryn about, and my offer to pick a fight with her to prove my point. I decide that on this one little errand, I'll prove both Taryn wrong about her not being ready to channel his power, and Garrick wrong about her liking me. So as I'm passing right behind her, I taunt Violet, saying, She's not wrong! in reference to Rhiannon's advice. I'm perfectly well aware that I'm being hypocritical, considering that Violet's retort that being coddled isn't going to do her any favors is exactly what I've been telling her about Atos, 
But hey, I'm picking a fight, not trying to remain logically consistent. Liam stands to acknowledge me, and I give him an approving nod. Well aware. Violence throws back over her shoulder at me with attitude. Go away unless you have something useful to say. That's it. I'm out for everyone's blood tonight. I head for a nearby mat directly in Violet's line of sight while casually responding, Move faster. You'll be less likely to die. How's that for useful? She might hate me as a person, but since she's not privately denying her physical attraction to me either, I'll do my best to make the clash of those two internal forces as aggravating as possible for her. Garrick and I both start loosening up as Violence resumes sparring with a renewed vigor. I note with irritation that she isn't wearing her armor, and glancing around the gym, I'm further incensed that she's doing so while Jack Barlow is here too. I see what you're doing, Garrick quietly admonishes. The whole point of this was to try and figure out how they really feel about us. Stop trying to undermine things by purposefully pissing her off. There's nothing to undermine, I mutter angrily. How many times do I have to tell you she hates me simply because of who I am? Even if she could stand my personality, it could never happen anyway. No wonder she keeps trying to convince herself you're such an insufferable ass. You make it so easy to believe. Our glares clash, and we nod simultaneously. We both remove our shirts, toss them aside, and square up. This is the only circumstance when I focus my second signet on him, and doing so gives me a fraction of a second's forewarning before Garrick explodes at me and starts raining down a barrage of kicks and punches so fast that I doubt I could deflect them all if I couldn't see his intentions. Garrick must have spent plenty of time appealing to Dune lately because even with me effectively cheating by using a signet when we'd agreed on no powers or even weapons, it still takes me a full minute of gradually regaining from being on the back foot. I suspect he's cheating a little bit as well, upping his speed with lesser magic. Then it's my turn to go on offense. Sweat is already starting to bead on our skin as I test his defenses for a minute or two. Then I decide that perhaps I'm cheating a little too much, and I ease up just enough to allow myself a split second to glance over at Imogen. Her eyes are locked on Garrick, and she's so distracted that she apparently doesn't realize Riddick, who she has in a headlock, is about to pass out as he frantically tries to tap out. The next time I look, she's let Riddick go, and he's sprawled on the mat, gulping air vigorously while she continues to watch Garrick, completely oblivious to anything else. I spare a glance at her every minute or so, and her preoccupation persists until a couple of minutes later when I see that she's been distracted by a commotion on the mat next to hers. I catch Garrick's incoming fist with a shadow, clearly communicating the need for a pause, and he follows my gaze to where Violet lies flat on her back. Jack Barlow is at the edge of the same mat, and as I take note of Liam standing between them, I hear him say, Walk the fuck away, Barlow, while brandishing a dagger. I walk over, allowing my body language to exude my genuine excitement that I might get to fuck someone up for real, which catches Barlow's attention. He regards me with a mixture of anger and trepidation. She's only alive because of you, he accuses me. I mentally laugh. He'd have been right if Taryn hadn't stepped in before I could interfere with Tynan's attempted murder of her at Threshing, but when it comes to Barlow himself, violence neutralized him all on her own. Right, because I'm the one who buried a dagger in your shoulder at Threshing, I scoff at him. Violet regains her feet, apparently recovering from having the wind knocked out of her. Barlow ignores my comment and leans around Liam to taunt her. We could just settle this now, if you're done hiding behind the big strong men. I can see that she instinctively hates the kernel of truth in Jack's words. She doesn't respond in the few seconds during which both Garrick arrives to stand at my side and even Imogen edges closer from the next mat over, making violence even more self-conscious about Jack being right. That's what I thought, Barlow says contemptuously, and then he has the gall to blow her a fucking kiss. I'm about to use shadows to drag him over here and knock his teeth out when I see Violet's intention to humiliate him herself, so I decide to let her handle Barlow herself as a way of standing at her side, at least metaphorically, rather than in front of her like Atos always does. You ran! She hurls at him. That day in the field, you fucking ran when it was three on one, and we both know when it comes down to it, you'll run again. That's what cowards do. Jack's expression turns apoplectic while Atos lectures her. Oh, for fuck's sake, Violet. She's not wrong, I smirk at Jack, and the comment seems to inspire Garrick to laugh and Barlow to launch himself forward in an attempt to attack violence. Liam intercepts him, though, and starts shoving him away. 
Barlow doesn't relent, so Liam ends up pushing him all the way out of the gym, and I close and lock the doors with a sweep of my hand. What the hell were you thinking, egging him on like that? Atos demands, beginning to advance on Violet. Oh, now you feel like talking to me? She retorts, but I step between the two, locking eyes with violence. Atos' complaint doesn't deserve to be acknowledged, and I have my own bone to pick with her that should be much more worthy of Taren's attention. Give us a second. I order Atos and anyone else around without removing my glare from violence. I see a couple of people back away in my peripheral vision, and my focus narrows to her alone. You want to tell me why the fuck you're not wearing that? I ask through gritted teeth, pointing at her armor on the bench at the side of the room. I have to wash it at some point, she retorts, showing no fear in the face of my considerable anger. And you thought that would be a good idea during sparring? I demand. The obvious implication is that she could be hurt by a friend, as just happened, but I know she's also smart enough to realize that the interaction with Barlow highlights the danger of not wearing it in the presence of enemies who would do it intentionally, too. I washed it before sparring, knowing it could dry while your guard dog keeps watch, as opposed to sleeping without it, because we both know what happens behind closed doors around here. Not behind yours anymore, I grit out. I made sure of it. Because I'm supposed to trust you? She demands incredulously. Yes, I say with exasperation. And you make it so easy, she quips. You know I can't kill you, I say, struggling to maintain my self-control. How does she always manage to do that to me? Fuck, Soren Gale, the entire quadrant knows I can't kill you. She shrinks ever so slightly in response to me having encroached on her space in an effort to drive my point home. It only lasts an instant before she defiantly stands straight again. That doesn't mean you can't hurt me, she accuses. I inwardly startle as if she slapped me. I haven't been using my second signet on her during this conversation since I already feel guilty about trying to manipulate her by showing off with Garrick. I guess there's no need to do so now to see if it worked. That could not have been a more clear answer. I know that some of that must have come across on my face, so I do my best to compose myself as quickly as possible, rather than reaching for my chest to check whether she just ripped my heart out. With my wing leader mask back in place, I force my emotional devastation into the mental box where I keep the rest of it, slam it shut, and force myself to analyze the situation objectively. I'd completely forgotten where we were. There are at least 20 people watching us. Shit, I need to start distancing myself from her again to keep from losing control like that. Right now, I need to save face and not concede having figuratively lost to a first year. Stop training with a bow staff, I order, latching onto the first legitimate criticism I can find. It's too easy to knock out of your hands. Stick to the daggers. I was doing just fine until Taren barged into my head with all his anger and distracted me, she retorts. Unbelievable. She's not even going to let me win the argument I'm indisputably right about. Then learn to block him out, I tell her. What, with all this power I'm wielding? Or were you unaware that I'm still not channeling? She arches an eyebrow in challenge. I lean in again, even closer this time, not caring that she's afraid of me anymore. I am annoyingly aware of everything you do. I whisper furiously. She doesn't shrink away at all this time, glaring back at me with just as much anger. Wingleader Ryerson, Atos interrupts. She's just not used to the bond yet. She'll learn how to block it out. Violence gasps and steps back. I'm not sure if it's because she just remembered we're in public like I did a minute ago, or because she's hurt by her oldest friend's unfathomable idea that she still needs his protection. You choose the oddest times to defend her, Atos. I drawl in annoyance as I finally tear my eyes from her to face him, and the most convenient times not to. Atos clenches his fists and flexes his jaw. His instinct shows that he understood perfectly well my implication about his actions during the Amber Mavis trial, which I heard about from Liam. I return my attention to violence just long enough to say, Do us both a favor and put the fucking armor back on. Then I turn and walk away, making for where Garrick is waiting for me at the opposite side of the mat. I hear a quiet gasp behind me, and a picture of her instinct to wonder where the scars on my back came from arrives through our bond as clear as day. I quickly snatch my shirt from Garrick and pull it back on. 
I swear to Zinal, this whole thing couldn't have backfired any worse. Garrick seems to understand my general train of thought and moves to walk with me as I turn toward the door. Leave me alone, I say quietly and walk away. I take the tiniest bit of comfort in the fact that, at the very least, I proved Tarn wrong. If he doesn't think she's ready to channel after wiping me with the floor that badly, she's definitely going to end up spontaneously combusting because he'll never be convinced. I pull on the doors and find that they're still locked from when I used lesser magic to close Barlow out. I unlock them with a flick of my hand and wrench them open to find Liam standing there with his arms folded across his chest. I forgot I locked you out too. Sorry, I say as I walk by him. That's what you're sorry about? Liam demands, turning and matching my quick pace stride for stride. What are you doing? I ask. Get back there and guard Sorengale. Screw that! You know Imogen or Garrick will get her back to her room safe if we're not around to do it, and you need to talk to me. Pretty sure you mean you need to talk to me, I retort. But I need to talk to Sagale before I become an ornament impaled on Terrence Morningstar tail. Liam steps in front of me and stops dead, blocking my way out into the courtyard. No, you need to hear this, Zayden, because I know something that you apparently haven't realized yet. Dune, give me strength. I mumble before pushing past him. Fine, you can walk with me. I need to stop by my room anyway. I have to grab something before I do this thing with Sigale, I say as we enter the courtyard. Liam looks around surreptitiously. From what I could hear outside those doors, you're being a self-absorbed ass, he hisses quietly. Well the fuck aware, I say at full volume, not giving a shit if anyone else is out here or if they hear me. What of it? Zayden, you're not the hero of this story, Liam says with exasperation. I stop again, taken off guard by what a weird way that is to say, What? I ask, completely bewildered. Liam stops and turns back to me. Okay, I get that everyone's the hero of their own story or whatever, but I'm talking about the grand scheme of things, looking at the bigger picture here. I'm still not following at all, I say, starting to walk again. I'm half-tempted to read his intentions to figure out what the hell he's on about. You know, the... Liam looks around again to confirm that no one can overhear. The revolution, he whispers. Stopping the resurgence of dark wielders, good versus evil, the whole thing. I never said I was the hero of... Oh, please. Liam scoffs as we approach the spiral stairway of the dormitory building. You didn't need to say it. Ever since your dad was killed and you took responsibility for all of us, everyone that knows about the whole thing has simply believed it inherently. And that includes me, and even you. I'm not saying I agree, I state carefully as we start climbing the steps. But if that were the case, what changed your mind? You're really that wrapped up in yourself that you can't see it even when I bring it to your attention? Liam almost laughs. Apparently, I say, racking my brain. Do you mean Azurai? It was a fucking miracle that he was basically resurrected, and there's something to be said for who his parents are. It's impressive that you can be so close and so wrong at the same time. Liam chuckles. Okay, I get that I'm a raging narcissist here, but... I take a beat as we pass the landing of the first year's floor, checking with my shadows that nobody is in or approaching the stairwell. I am the god's damned heir apparent, as much as I wish I weren't. I am Fen Ryerson's only child. I am responsible for all of the orphans of the apostasy. I am burdened with the strongest powers of our generation. I honestly wish I could shrug off all this weight onto someone else, but who else that knows about the whole thing could or would take it on? I never said it was someone who already knows, Liam smirks. And with that, it clicks. He's talking about Violet fucking Sorengale. Not one more word until we get into my room, I tell him as we reach the top of the stairs. We walk in silence, making our way toward my door at the end of the hall. We pass Soleil as she emerges from Mason's room. She nods to us in greeting, and we wordlessly return the gesture. When we get to the end of the hall, I unlock my door and usher Liam inside. I lock the door behind us again and turn back to Liam. What the hell are you on about? She is more likely to become the biggest problem for the revolution, not its new hero. What makes you say that? Liam inquires, still wearing an expression of amusement. For one, she'd been handpicked by fucking Markham to be the next head of the scribes. I expect this to end the discussion, but Liam just shakes his head amiably. 
in case you don't know, which you sure as shit should, the main responsibility of that job is to cover up the fact that dark wielders even exist, not fight them. And since when have you placed any value in Markham's judgment? Liam asks. All right, how about her own judgment then? You know better than pretty much anyone else how much she fucking hates me. You really think she's eager to take over my role for me? Well, you have been remarkably unlikable toward her. Frankly, I think both of you are just pissed about your respective self-imposed rules that you can't be together. Fine, if you won't accept my arguments about why your theory is bullshit, then you give me yours so that I can shoot those down just as easily. How about we trust the judgment of dragons? Liam suggests. Sigail chose you. Clearly that would indicate that you're very important, as she's probably in the top ten most powerful dragons on the continent. But it's the fact that she's bonded to Tarn that makes them arguably the most powerful force in dragonkind together. And who did he, the more powerful of the pair, choose as his rider, making them destined to become more powerful than you? I clench my jaw, unwilling to voluntarily offer the information that I can already see is going to result in me losing a second fight back to back. Liam continues, And do you think he would have chosen her if there was any chance that she wouldn't make the right choice when the time came? I sigh. I have reason to doubt the old adage that dragons don't make mistakes, especially in the case of Tarn. But even assuming you're right, that still wouldn't prove that she's some kind of savior. You're right. To prove that, we also have to take into consideration Andarna. At the sound of her name, I feel the bond between Sigail and I open up for the first time all day, as if she somehow had a trigger listening for that keyword. You didn't tell him Andarna's secret, did you? She asks testily. Of course not. He's the one that brought her up. Not only did Violet bond the second most powerful dragon on the continent, Liam persists, and again, together with Sigail, the pair is probably an even more formidable force than Coda. But in addition to Tarn, she also became the first rider to bond with a dragon from the Feathertail breed, and the first rider to bond two dragons. It baffles me that no one seems to be talking about what such an unprecedented occurrence might mean in the greater arc of history. Why should it mean anything on that scale? Sure, bonding Tarn should make her one of the most powerful riders of this generation, but nobody knows anything about Andarna. Feathertails are supposed to abhor violence, so why would she bond any rider? Maybe she's just insane or traumatized. Or maybe it's because Violet isn't just any rider. She also hates killing, just like the Feathertails. Maybe Andarna bonded with her because she has the mind of a scribe. What? Why the hell would she do that? I never mentioned this before because I always thought it was just a silly kid's fable, but when I was 12, my mom decided that I should start learning about the revolution, about what she was doing and why. At first, I was terrified about the venom, and to try and make me feel better, she told me about something she'd read in one of her old tomes of runes. She said the book was from the Isle Kingdoms, and in it there was a story about how the venom were defeated in the Great War, but it also made some kind of prediction about them coming back one day. Supposedly, it said that the one who could restore nature's balance would be a rider with the mind of a scribe. There was something special about their dragon as well that I don't remember, but what could be more special than it being a feather tail, the breed of dragon that never bonds with riders? Or maybe that whole nature's balance thing means they're supposed to have one dragon associated with the whole mind of a scribe thing, and a second, more traditional dragon associated with their rider's heart? I don't know, man. I never actually read it myself. I'm just trying to remember something my mom told me over eight years ago when I was a kid. Exactly, I say, gripping his shoulder in a comforting gesture. I remember how freaked out I was when I learned about Venon and what my dad was up to. The talk he gave me was much less comforting, but if he had given me any kind of hope like that, I would have clung on to it for dear life. You're saying you think she was just making it up to help me feel better? Liam asks skeptically. I didn't know Colonel Mari that well, so I'm sure you'd know better than I would. I'm not saying your mom didn't come across something like that. I'm just saying your first impression of it was probably closer to the mark. It sounds like a fable, a fun story written to entertain or comfort kids. Otherwise, that would make it some sort of prophecy or something. But General Melgren's signet is the closest thing there's ever been to precognition, so I just don't see how it could be true. Liam nods with a slightly sad expression on his face. I do take your point, though, I offer. The fact that Taren bonded her would suggest that she'll eventually become more powerful than me, and he probably wouldn't have if he wasn't sure she'd end up on the right side of the revolution. And maybe there's something, who knows what, to the fact that she's also the first rider to bond a feather tail and a second dragon. 
I'll try to be less wrapped up in myself and recognize that she's likely to play a huge role in things. Yeah, good. That's the main thing I was after. Just be cognizant of the fact that she's not her mother. I'm positive that she'll come over to our side and be a super important part of the revolution. Plus, the two of you will be stuck together forever because of your dragons, so maybe cool it with being at each other's throat all the time. Liam starts heading for the door. And I don't know about the other thing, Liam muses, pausing with his hand on the door handle. I was thinking right along those same lines you just laid out for years, but Violet's story seems to be fitting with that one my mom told me uncannily well. To me at least, it feels like that would be a suspiciously accurate coincidence. With that, he walks out and closes the door behind him. I'm left there, not knowing what to think. An hour or so later, I'm laying on my bed, still contemplating what Liam had told me. Now, wing leader. Oh, shit. I'd completely forgotten that I'd been on my way to try and patch things up with Segale before Liam drove everything else out of my mind. Right. Sorry. I'm on it. I shoot back quickly, springing out of bed and grabbing a rolled churum from the locked drawer I keep it in. In a matter of seconds, I'm leaving my room and locking the door behind me. Whenever I feel like I have enough time to get away before Segal and Taren get started, I always try to make it outside to smoke so I don't stink up my room. I quickly make my way down the passage through the Citadel's foundations. I emerge from the opening that overlooks the river and the oak trees where we hold the larger meetings of our club, as Violet calls it. I lean up against the wall in my usual spot and open my bond with Tern. If there's anything else you want to do before we get the show started, I'd do it now. I'll leave this bond open so you can hear what I'm saying to Zagale, but don't come barging through if you hear something you don't love. Leave this to me like we agreed. I do not take orders from humans. Tern rumbles in response. Since this is apparently the most I'm going to get from him, I just shake my head and open the bond to Zagale. I take a few moments and a long, calming breath to collect myself. Your analogy was flawed, I say down my bond with Segal. But if we're going to use it anyway, then I would thank her myself. Segal doesn't immediately block me out with her mental shields, as she's so often done these past couple of weeks whenever I've tried to talk to her about anything that isn't urgent revolution-related business. I take that as a good sign, along with the fact that I can feel her curiosity. Don't get me wrong, I continue. I'd definitely be pissed off at first, for probably at least a few weeks, but once I got my head back on straight, I'd thank her. What are you talking about? Sigail demands, her curiosity giving way to irritation. You asked me how I'd feel about it if you were responsible for completing some task, screwed it up, and then Taren convinced Violet to salvage things for you by getting naked and making out with every rider in the quadrant at the same time. I see how that's meant to be a reversal of our situation so I could appreciate how you must feel, but there's a flaw in that logic. Violet isn't even my girlfriend, much less my bonded maid of... at least several decades, I'd assume? That doesn't help your case. It makes it even harder for him to justify doing it, or for you to justify thanking him for it. Sigale says, This isn't meant to help my case. It's meant to illustrate that I'm finally wrapping my head around the gravity of the situation now. I'm sorry that I didn't before. Well, clearly, you still don't truly understand. Otherwise, what you'd be apologizing for is thanking him, rather than trying to prove that you are right for doing so. Will you let me at least try to explain what I mean? Please? Sigail doesn't respond, but she doesn't raise her shields either. You're absolutely right. This is all my fault because I fucked up that trial. If I were as good at influencing people as my dad was, none of this would have happened in the first place. I should have either done a better job or been able to accept the fact that I couldn't and found a different way to eliminate Amber Mavis like you'd suggested. If that were the extent of the scenario and our roles were reversed, then yes, that alone would have pissed me off. I decide to try a little humor to gauge whether this is working at all yet. I don't know that I'd have the balls to actually express my anger with you, but it'd be there. I note that the joke falls flat and that her annoyance, which had begun to ebb, starts flowing again. Right. No more jokes. Anyway, let me make my main point real quick in case I end up fucking this up too and you shut me out before I can get to everything. You called me a tactless pissant, and I'm owning up to that. It was tactless of me to thank him for something that you were legitimately hurt by, and I was a pissant for doing it. I apologize. Also, also, it wasn't me that Taryn did it for, and he's sorry too. Taren growls through our bond, but I ignore him. The first part of that was not bad. Sigail sighs, and I can feel most of her anger dissolving. But Taren isn't sorry. Not in the sense that he thinks he was wrong to do it, but I know he's sorry that there was no other alternative, and that he wishes he hadn't had to do it. 
I feel Terran back off through the bond, apparently coming around to my approach. Even if that's true, you wouldn't know. Look at it this way. Imagine for a moment that Violet and I did mean as much to each other as you and Terran do. Then let's say you screwed something up and were at risk of having to live life on the lamb or were even in imminent, potentially mortal danger. If somehow Violet were able to reveal the truth by intimately exposing herself to everyone in the vicinity, do you think she'd be doing it for you? No, of course she'd be doing it for me, where in this scenario I'd have been her mated other half for many decades. Sigail remains silent, so I press on. Okay, I'm going to drop the metaphor because it's getting confusing. Taryn obviously did it because, one, it prevented you from being forced to spend a significant fraction, if not most of your time, on the run with me. So, in that sense, to a certain extent, he also did it for his own sake in addition to yours. See, if you'd led with an explanation of how he was acting selfishly, you could have started convincing me much sooner. I grin. The fact that she's the one making jokes now is a good sign. Fair enough. But the main reason he did it is because you care about me. Even if I'm a far distant second in terms of the most important male in your life, he knows how upset you'd be if my life were ruined or perhaps even ended. If Violet sacrificed her intimacy, which had exclusively belonged to me for the previous several decades, in order to save you for my sake, well, I'd like to think that after pouting and raging about it for a few weeks, I'd eventually be able to get to a place where I could thank her. She declines to respond, but since I can feel that her emotions haven't turned negative again, I decide to try my luck with another joke. Not to mention that if I became a fugitive from Navarre, it could cripple or maybe even kill the revolution. Yeah, come to think of it, his main reason for doing it was probably to save the world from Dark Wielders. Sagia laughs for a moment before falling silent again. I know you're mostly joking, but frankly there's some truth to that. He's even said as much. That's part of the reason why I've been so moody. I feel guilty because I can't get over what he did, even though I know it was for the greater good. I mean, to a certain extent, but I still think he mostly did it for you. And again, he's sorry that there wasn't any other way to save you from my fuck-up. I can accept your rationale for why he did it. That's logical enough. But you can't know that he's sorry in that sense. Sigail asserts. Oh, I know it for a fact. How? She challenges. Would you believe me if I told you that your big bad human affairs are beneath me mate would come to a human for help in making this right? No. Sigail says flatly. He would never stoop to asking a human for help. Admittedly, it was less asking me for help and more ordering me to fix my fuck-ups, but when I made the point that we'd both upset you and that the only way for us to fix it was by working together, he eventually acquiesced and agreed to do it for your sake. I don't believe you. I'm serious. He even agreed to hear me out sometime about the saddle as a show of good faith. I say earnestly, still slightly surprised that he eventually agreed to my whole plan. I sense Terran's surprise and annoyance again. Well, he didn't know it's about a saddle, I admit, but he said he'd be willing to at least listen to my request for a favor. How do I know that you're not just making this up and banking on the fact that he'll be willing to claim that practically anything is true in order to get back into my good graces? Sigail probes. Yes, imagine Terran doing something so out of character of his own accord. I drawl, my tone filled with sarcasm and happy amusement now that I know I've clinched this. See, I knew you wouldn't believe me without proof, but I guess it's not so far-fetched when you consider that, just like sharing the memory, he was doing it for you. I can prove it's true, because how else would I know that Taryn is waiting outside your lair right now with something for you? It's an... I hope I get this right. Uwileb heist lak rosta? I have no idea what that's supposed to mean, but he assured me that you'd have to accept that there's no other way I could possibly know that it's somehow meaningful to you if he hadn't told me. I wait for a moment while Sigail presumably walks out of the lair. I'm suddenly flooded with a sense of joy and gratitude that's almost immediately replaced by a wave of lust so powerful that the intangible feeling almost physically knocks me over. You're forgiven. Good night, Sigail says hurriedly. I smile and pull the churum out of my pocket. About ten minutes later, I can sense the shadows in the stairway through the foundations being disturbed. Someone is descending them, their power causing the mage lights inside to flare to life, dispersing the darkness. Since they're bathed in light, I can't try to get a sense of who it might be by feeling their general shape with my shadows, so as they emerge from the nearby opening, I cloak myself in darkness instead. Of course, it's Violet, here to ruin my buzz by reminding me of all the depressing shit I finally managed to stop dwelling on for a few minutes. 
Just a couple of hours ago, I was telling myself I'd have to start keeping my distance again because I can't control myself around her normally, and now I find myself alone with her when my inhibitions are at their lowest. Fantastic. I take a moment to look at her as she lifts her face to the sky, breathing heavily and savoring the cold air, my mind warring between drinking in her heart-stoppingly gorgeous features and trying to picture her as being destined to restore nature's balance like Liam had described. Probably because of the churum, it doesn't take long for the former to win out. I don't know why I have a thing for braided hair, especially when it's woven tight against the head like the crown she usually puts hers in. But tonight her hair is down and flowing in the wind. Maybe it's just that I never get to see it like that, but somehow I like it even better. Or maybe it's because I can better make out the two-tone transition in color from dark to silver, not unlike some people whose hair slowly gets more sun-bleached the longer it is, which I'm also a fan of, but hers is taken to the extreme. I also take note of her jawline, which is accentuated right now with her face turned up to the sky. It ends in a chin that's small but pointed and serves to highlight the rounder, deliciously soft features of the rest of her face. I see her sniff at the air, and knowing there's no hiding the scent of the churum, I let the darkness cloaking me fall. Her gaze finds mine, and we simply look at each other, the moment feeling charged by some kind of energy. Is that... churum? She asks, surprised. I exhale the smoke I've been holding in for... I'm not sure how long. Want some? I offer, before remembering that I'm actually pissed off at her and just got lost in her beauty. Unless you're here to continue our earlier argument, in which case, none for you. She looks at me with an expression that seems almost offended. No, we're not allowed to smoke that. Great, back to her hating everything about me again. Hooray. Yeah, well, the people that made that rule obviously weren't bonded to Segale and Tern, now were they? I taunt, knowing which of Tern's feelings must be flooding her right now. Do I feel bad about immediately going back on what I told Liam about trying to be more civil toward her? If she's going to regard me like dragon shit she just scraped off the bottom of her shoe, then fuck no. Well, maybe a little. It helps with distancing yourself, beyond what shielding does, of course. I explain, offering the churum again with a slight curiosity in my expression to let her know I'm legitimately asking if she wants the help. She shakes her head, but walks over and leans up against the wall next to me. Suit yourself, I say, taking one last drag and then snuffing it out on the wall beside me. I feel like I'm on fucking fire. Yeah, that happens. I laugh, remembering what it felt like the first time this happened to me. And as Liam pointed out, Taryn is more powerful than even Segale, so even I can barely imagine what kind of horny hell she's going through. Shit, that puts me in the wrong kind of mindset, though. I look down at her, and it's obvious that despite her hatred of me, which she just solidified in the clearest possible terms a couple of hours ago, she's so lost in that same mindset that she might throw caution to the wind. Oh, violence. You're going to have to learn to shield against Tern, or his escapades with Segale will drive you mad. Or into someone's bed. She winces and takes a deep breath, bracing her hand against the wall. I can tell why. Even through my shields and the high, I can feel a particularly strong wave of passion washing over Segale and presumably Terran as well. I have to get out of this mindset, I order myself. Oh, I know. She breathes unsteadily. I am horrified to see Liam again. Liam? Why? I demand, turning to face her fully before I can control myself. I take a breath, forcing myself to try and think clearly rather than simply reacting. Where is your bodyguard? I'm my own bodyguard, she asserts, and he's in bed. She presses the side of her face against the cold stone as if it could siphon away any of her incomparable heat. Your bed? I almost shout reflexively. She opens her eyes and they search mine, probably seeing my frustration and self-loathing. No, not that it should matter to you, she says contemptuously. I let out a breath that I, again, hadn't realized I was holding. It doesn't matter to me. I outright lie. As long as you're both consenting, and trust me, you're in no condition to consent. You have no idea what I'm capable of consenting to- She almost doubles over as I feel another powerful wave from Segale crashing against my shields. I breathe through the lust that threatens to break through and instinctively put an arm across her back and around her waist, trying to provide her with some stability so she doesn't fall over. Wherever my arm touches her, I feel an almost electric tingle against my skin. 
Oh, shit. Touching her is a bad idea even when I'm not high and fending off Sagale's desire in addition to my own. Why the hell aren't you shielding? I frustratedly say the first thing that comes to mind other than that. Not all of us have been given lessons. He just started channeling before all this, and in case you forgot, you're only allowed to attend Professor Carr's class if you can wield. Always thought that was a ridiculous rule. I exhale and shake my head, trying to clear it. I reflect on the fact that both Liam and Brennan, two of the best people I know, have both pulled me aside recently to effectively shame me for the way I've treated her. Try to be less of a dick. If I were in her position, what would I want a friend to do? Alright, crash course. Only because I've been where you are and woken up with more than a few regrets. You're actually going to help me? She asks incredulously. I've been helping you for months! I say, immediately failing at the perspective-taking exercise and matching her level of incredulity. No, you sent Liam to help. He's been helping me for months. Weeks. Almost months. Whatever. Unbelievable. I'm the one who burst through your door and killed everyone who attacked you, I remind her. And then I removed the other threat to your life with a very public, very polarizing display of vengeance. Liam didn't do that. I did. The crowd wasn't polarized. They were all for it. I was there. Only after Tarn shared the memory, I think. And even then, a sizable fraction of people were still on the fence, including... You were torn, I admonish her. In fact, you begged Tarn not to kill her, damn well knowing she'd just come after you again. Fine, but let's not pretend that you didn't do most of that for yourself. It would be inconvenient for you if I died, she says defiantly. It's like she's purposefully trying to provoke me. You know what? We're not fighting tonight. Not if you want to learn how to shield. Fine, we're not fighting. Teach me. She practically orders, lifting her pointed chin as if daring me to disobey. Gods, that shouldn't be as hot as it is. I can't let her take control that way right now. There's almost no chance she'll be able to learn to shield well enough on the spot, and if she can't overcome Tarn's lust, if she demands that I do other things in that same way, there's no way I'd have the self-control to stop myself. Ask me nicely. I say, encroaching in her space to reassert that I'm the one in control right now. Fuck that scent of hers. Have you always been this tall? She exclaims. No, I was a child at some point. I drawl. She's resisting letting me have control, and there's absolutely no chance she'll learn to shield if she won't really listen to what I'm telling her. Ask me nicely, Violence, or I'm gone. She squirms. It's already taking everything I have to control myself. I never thought I'd be in a situation with her where she'd be so turned on, and it's even hotter than I could have imagined. But she's clearly feeling uncomfortable about it, so I have to either help her get it under control or fucking flee because I don't know how much longer my self-control can hold out. How often is it like this with them? She asks. Often enough that you're going to need proper shields. You won't ever be able to block them out completely, and sometimes they forget to block us, like tonight, I explain. That's why the Churum helps. At least it's like walking by a brothel instead of actively participating in one. Right then. She takes a deep breath, seemingly working up the nerve to comply. All right. Will you teach me? It's the first time she's been even remotely courteous toward me, and I like it. Say, please, I instruct to test whether she'll actually do as I tell her, because otherwise this lesson will never work. Are you always this difficult? She chafes. Only when I know I have something you need. What can I say? I like making you squirm, I say truthfully. Wouldn't have normally admitted to that, but in for a penny. It's like a sweet little slice of payback for what you've put me through these last couple of months. Gods, her hair. As beautiful as the snowflakes on it are, they can't compare to that hair. And without thinking, I gently brush the flakes away. She snaps me back to reality when she exclaims, What I've put you through? You've scared me nearly to death once or twice. I respond reflexively. Shit. At least she can interpret it as a selfish concern for my own safety rather than it being an actual expression of my concern for hers. 
So I think saying please is a fair request. She fumes for a few seconds and bats another snowflake away from her nose. Then she takes a long, calming breath and starts, As you prefer, in a simpering and obviously sarcastic expression of a high-born lady, which suddenly becomes my new favorite intonation. Zayden, would you pretty, pretty please teach me how to shield before I accidentally climb you like a tree and we both wake up with regrets? Holy shit. That is easily the hottest thing I've ever heard. Oh, I'm firmly in control of my faculties, I say, telling another blatant lie and hoping that the smile I can't hold back doesn't give me away. And since you asked so nicely, I pivot to fully face her. If there's any chance of this working, I'm going to have to be able to give her guidance that is as tailored as possible. Plus, I want to explore what's going on with our mental bond, and my second signet is always stronger with physical contact. I gently take her face in my hands. Oh, that might be too much for me. I slide them back away from her bare cheeks, hoping that that will feel less intimate. But now my fingers are entwined in that hair, and I'm holding her head like I would if I were going to kiss her. Idiot. It requires touching me? She asks, and perhaps the clearest instinct I've ever seen shines through our mental connection. She's reveling in the sensation of my skin against hers. Not at all. Just one of the perks of not thinking too clearly. You have incredibly touchable skin. Not thinking clearly is right. Her reaction is just because of Tarn, or even if this is her legitimate attraction to you, that doesn't mean she's stopped hating you, I lecture myself. You need to envision somewhere, I tell her. Anywhere. I prefer the top of my favorite hillside near what's left of Eurasia. Wherever it is, it needs to feel like home. I can see her mental image of the archives in the scribe quadrant. If that's the first thing that comes to mind when she thinks of home, then it's no longer conjecture. That confirms she really does have the mind of a scribe. Feel your feet hit the ground and dig in some. I'm able to watch as she envisions her mental self make contact with the floor and move her heels back and forth slightly against the marble. This is far beyond anything I've ever managed with my intrinsic ability before. Got it. She says, That's called grounding, keeping your mental self somewhere so you aren't swept away by the power. Now, call to your power. Open your senses. I see a deluge of burning orange power that I recognize as Tarns from his onyx bond in my own mind. I've only ever witnessed this much power when I've walked the edge of burning out, pulling as much of Sigale's power as I could, and this is Tarns' baseline? There's so much that it forces outward on the walls. If they don't breach and destroy her mental archives, it might drown her if she can't stem the flow. I swim up out of the bond to check on her physical body. She's heating up, and the expression on her face is pained. Too much, she gasps. Focus on your feet. Stay grounded. Can you see where the power flows from? If not, just pick a place. I tell her urgently, trying to hide my fear that if I fail to help her control this, it might overwhelm her and the consequences could be fatal. Shit! I shouldn't have had her do this before Tarn was on hand to help. I see it, she says. Perfect. You're a natural. It takes most people a week just to learn to ground. I reflect, hoping that the praise will encourage her. Now, do whatever you need to do to mentally wall yourself off from that current. Tarn is the source. You block that power, you'll have some control back. Her hands clench around my forearms. You've got this, I say, desperation leaking into my voice. Whatever you create in your mind is real to you. Shut off the valve, build a wall, whatever makes sense. It's a door, she says in a strained voice as her fingernails start biting through my sleeve. I mentally plunge back down our bond and watch her throw all of her weight against the huge circular vault-like door of the archives, and it begins inching shut. There you go. Keep going, I tell her, forgetting to pretend that I can't see what she's doing mentally. I watch in utter amazement as she continues slowly heaving the door shut. There is an absolute torrent pouring through it that should be physically impossible to overcome. But this isn't physical. Her mental strength is so formidable that it rivals even Tarn's power. It's as if she's an image of Amari herself. I've got the door shut, she gasps. Great, lock it, I instruct, 
pulling back as it's no longer necessary for me to be mentally present there, making it suddenly feel like it would be a violation for me to stay. Instead, I resurface into reality again and simply take advantage of her eyes still being closed to stare unabashedly at her luminescent face. It changed, she tells me. I can see through the door. Yeah, you'll never be able to fully block him. Got it locked? She nods. Open your eyes, but do your best to keep that door locked. It means keeping one foot grounded. Don't be surprised if it slips. We'll just start again. Her eyes open and find mine. He's... She starts before falling silent again. But I don't know what she's trying to say. I won't read her because... You are... Astonishing. I declare, shaking my head in disbelief. I couldn't do that for weeks. She grins bashfully. I could die happily if that were the last thing I ever saw. Guess I have a superior teacher, she offers. I instinctively stroke my thumbs over the top of her jaw. My eyes fall to her perfect lips, and without thinking, I start pulling us together. What am I doing? I immediately let go and draw back. Damn it, I curse myself. I was just thinking about my promise to Brennan no more than five minutes ago. Touching you was a bad idea. The worst. She breathes, but I'm just barely able to see her tongue glide along the inside of her bottom lip. An involuntary noise somewhere between a sigh and a growl escapes my lips. Kissing you would be a cataclysmic mistake. Calamitous, she softly agrees. Somewhere in my subconscious, some part of my mind tries to make my brain re-engage, but I don't want it to. We'll both regret it. I state, shaking my head because I know I shouldn't do it, but I can't tear my gaze away from her shapely lips. Naturally. She sighs, but she tips that pointed chin up at me again, and this time it's clearly her way of bidding me to kiss her. Fuck it. I surge forward, claiming her mouth with mine. I push her up against the wall firmly, and she lets me, kissing me back insistently. I return my hands to the sides of her face, holding her head and upper neck, my fingers spearing through that extraordinary hair again. I squeeze them together, gently grasping the hair between each finger, and I use that leverage to tilt her head back further so I can press my body even closer to hers. She parts her lips, and I take the invitation, finding her tongue with my own. She grabs fistfuls of my shirt to pull at me urgently. My gods, this woman knows how to turn me on. She tastes like sweet citrus and some other unidentifiable forbidden fruit. I feel her suck my bottom lip between her teeth before she bites it and pulls, stopping just short of it being painful. Violence, I groan. Even though I don't mean to read her, I suddenly see an image clearly showing her intention, or maybe it's more of a need, to get closer. I'm already pressing her up against the wall, so I do the only thing I can think of to put more of her body in contact with mine. I take hold of her ass in my hands, where it fits fucking perfectly, and lift. Before I even have her head level with mine as I stand up straight, she's already wrapping her legs around me. Once I've drawn her up to my full height, she clamps down, her legs squeezing around my hips, and it feels like she's even locked her feet together behind my back. I pin her against the wall so she doesn't have to support her weight by holding on with her legs, only has to keep them wrapped around me if she wants to, and she doesn't release their grip. Her hands slide up the back of my head and tug at my hair. How is this happening? I kiss her as thoroughly as I'm capable of, knowing that this must be some kind of fluke and taking full, shameless advantage since I'll never get the opportunity again once she comes back to her senses. My hips instinctually roll forward into hers and she gasps. I use the opportunity to kiss along that fantastically defined jawline and then move down, licking and sucking on her bare neck. She pulls my face back to hers and we're kissing again, almost desperately, like we're about to die of thirst and the other person is life-giving water. I've never been this out of control before, ever, much less over a single kiss. Never felt this way about anyone. Suddenly, every nauseatingly corny love poem I've ever come across makes perfect sense. I feel her body go limp, overwhelmed by emotion and exhaustion and this kiss. Without meaning to, I can see through our bond that the foot she'd left grounded in her mental archives slips loose and the huge door flies open. 
Lightning explodes in the clouds of the snowstorm above us, and the deafening crack startles my brain back into gear. She's astonishing? I've never felt this way about anyone? Fucking hell. I'm in love with Violet Sorengale. I gasp and wrench my head back. She looks at me searchingly, but even with that confused expression, hers is still the most beautiful face I've ever seen, and I can't allow myself to look at her, so I squeeze my eyes shut. I take a step back, and rather than her unbelievable ass, I grab her hamstrings to guide her legs back toward the ground and set her down before swiftly backing away until she's well out of reach. You have to go. I bite out. At least I have control over what I say, if not my eyes, which continue to rove over her lithe body. Why? Because I can't. I drag my hands up through my hair and brace them at the top of my head, trying to catch my breath. And I refuse to act on desire that isn't yours. Which is another totally valid reason, if not the one that stopped me in my tracks. But nobody can ever know that one. Especially her. So you have to walk back up those steps. Now. Her brow furrows. But I want- This isn't your want, I say decidedly, lifting my face toward the heavens in exasperation. That's the fucking problem, and I can't leave you out here on your own, so have just a little mercy on me, and go. Her expression turns colder than the snowstorm swirling around us her hatred clearly solidifying again now that I can feel that Segale and Taren are finished, so Violet's emotions are no longer being manipulated by his. She nods her agreement and then turns and runs. Once she's gone, I turn and slam my back against the wall before slumping down it into a seated crouch. Just... Fuck. Hey, I hope you're liking my fanfiction. I just wanted to make clear that all rights belong to Rebecca Yaros and thank her for creating this incredible world and characters to have fun with. If you'd like to read along or would just prefer a text version of this story, you can find it online at Archive of Our Own. There will be a link to it in the video description below. Feel free to let me know what you think or provide constructive feedback in the comments. I always try to reply to any comments that allow me to share explanations of how I was thinking about or approaching specific parts of the narrative. And if you want a notification whenever I upload the video for the next chapter, you can get those by subscribing and clicking the bell. Thanks for listening.